we can't control the climate, even, even if we could eliminate CO2 emissions, we're not gonna be able to actually control the CO2 atmosphere and the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And we're not gonna be able to control the climate. Those things are more complex than simply, you know, turning off the spigot of mm -hmm. CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. So it's really about the futility of control when you're talking about these highly complex global problems. Judith Curry is a climate scientist who has published almost 200 scientific papers and books. She's Professor Emeritus of Georgia Institute of Technology and President of the Climate Forecast Applications Network. She served on NASA Advisory Council's Earth Science Subcommittee and also been a member of the National Academies Space Studies Board and a member of the National Academies Climate Research Group. More recently, she's written a brand new book on climate change called Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response. So, Professor Curry, thank you for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. I was looking at, uh, at, at your, uh, your write-up on Wikipedia, for whatever Wikipedia is worth. They, they refer to you as a contrarian scientist and a climate neo-skeptic. I'm not sure what a neo-skeptic is, but would you call yourself a contrarian scientist and, uh, or a climate change neo-skeptic? Okay, well, you know, the old fashioned definition of a scientist is someone who continually evaluates and assesses the evidence, reconsiders their assumptions and critically evaluates their conclusions. Um, that's what I do. And apparently in the field of climate science, that's sufficiently unusual that they have to find a different label for me. So they call me a contrarian and, you know, sometimes worse. Uh, with regards to neo-skeptic, what neo-skeptic means is somebody who challenges that the way to deal with climate change is through wind and solar energy. Right. That maybe climate change isn't the most important or that we should do nuclear power, or we should just, you know, budget for this and carry on. You know, there's all sorts of different approaches that one can imagine taking, but anyone who does not accept that, you know, the massive urgency of rushing to wind and solar power is called a neo-skeptic. Uh, can, can, can we turn to climate change? And I, it was very kind of you, you sent me a, a, a pre-printed copy of your, your book, which I think is due out on the 6th of June in about a month's time called climate uncertainty and risk, rethinking our response. And I have to say that having looked through it, I'm, I'm very impressed with it. It's a very closely argued book and a very interesting book too, and quite a challenging book. But it starts off with quite simply and straightforwardly with the uh, first question like, what is climate change? And I wondered, could you guide us through that? Because I think many of us take um, terms like climate change on board almost without thinking as to what they really mean and it'd be good to have a clear definition before us. Okay, when I was in graduate school, uh, circa 1980, um, climate change was something that we acknowledged had happened over the you know, entire Earth's history. Um, Earth processes, tectonics, volcanism, variations in the sun, variations in the earth-sun geometry, um, millennial scale um, changes in the ocean circulation, and, and many other, you know, processes like that. Um, in the 20th century, we came to realize that humans were changing the climate uh, through land use, deforestation, agriculture, urbanization, and also through changing the composition of the atmosphere from air pollution, particulates, you know, what we would normally call dirty air, but also the emission of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide. So there is now a human component to climate change. Now, what the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has done 
has redefined the word climate change, the term climate change, to mean human caused climate change that's associated with emissions. And then they say climate variability is all the other stuff. So anytime you talk about climate change now, there's the implicit assumption that the only thing that causes climate to change is burning fossil fuels, basically. I mean, all the other things is just noise and we don't need to think about it. And any and, and this promotes any time there's a, a severe weather event, a heat wave, a hurricane, whatever, we blame it on fossil fuel emissions rather than on natural weather and climate variability. So that they've done a sneaky slate of hand <laughs> um, in terms of redefining. That, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, but I think the question then would be, which is the signal and which is the noise? If you have climate variability caused by a whole pile of things and and climate change caused by man-made emissions, which is the bigger of the two? Which has the biggest influence? Which is the, the most significant? That, that, that's a subject of that isn't sufficiently debated, um, no. given that we've that the IPCC is only looking at dangerous human-caused climate change. People are just assuming that all that other stuff is noise or happens on long time scales or whatever. But you know, to me, this is the underlying signal um, of the climate system. And a lot of this information of what has gone on in the past is encoded in the deep ocean circulations and in the ice sheets. And there are many different time scales involved. So, you know, that, that's a, an unanswered question in terms okay. of you know, the, the warming that we've seen, especially since 1950, to what extent is that human caused or natural? Um, in the latter half of the 20th century, we also saw a grand solar maximum. Um, <laughs> which has to be some of the heating. The ocean circulations in the Pacific and Atlantic were conspiring to cause warming in the last quarter of the 20th century. And these things are essentially dismissed um, in favor of arguments that this is all fossil fuel driven warming. So, you know, we don't know. It's a hard thing to untangle, but people aren't really working on it because all the attention is trying is on trying to identify dangerous human caused climate change. Okay, so to summarize then, there are many causes for climate change, climate variability, of which man-made um, carbon dioxide processes, fossil fuels, may be a contributory factor, and we don't know which is the, the largest element at, at the present time because people don't look into it. One thing, though, that we all agreed on is that the, the, uh, the Earth is warming. Is that, is that a certain fact? Yes, the Earth has been warming since the, the mid-1800s. Um, right, since the Industrial Revolution. Well, it was still cold for a while. Okay, say if you time the Industrial Revolution as 1750, that was, you know, in the towards the tail end of the Little Ice Age, and it was still cold really into for the first part of the um, 19th century. And it started warming around the mid 19th century. Okay, so the Earth is warming, it's been warming since that time. Is it dangerous? Well, this is the weakest part of the whole argument. Um, you know, be, before the recent era, people called warm periods as the climate optimum, you know, the mid-Holocene optimum or the, the Roman optimum or whatever. You know, a warm period was always called an optimum. Okay, so now we have another warm period and it's called dangerous. Um, it's not dangerous yet, that's for sure. Um, people have been adapting very well to climate change, the number of deaths and have dropped precipitously, like by 97%, you know, over the last hundred years from extreme weather events. Well, the I... amount of damage when scaled to the gross domestic product um, 
has not increased. Um, so, you know, exactly what is dangerous, that the earth is greening. It seems to like the extra CO2. Um, the combination of more water and more CO2 have caused the planet to green fairly substantially. And we have, we see this from satellite records. Um, you know, to me, you know, the only thing that's unambiguously is so associated with the warming temperature that could be dangerous is sea level rise. And, you know, sea level rise is just creeping along. Um, you know, it's rising at about three millimeters per year. And if you stack two pennies on top of each other, that's about three millimeters. You know, <laughs> it's risen something like nine inches in a hundred years. But people are pred predicting uh, drastic climate uh, uh, sea level rise in the coming century. Um, if something catastrophic were to occur, like collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, and on and on it goes. But yeah, you know, bad things can happen. And if the West Antarctic ice sheet were to collapse, it may be more likely having to do with all the under ice volcanoes <laughs> that are in that region. Um, you know, so all these things are very complicated, but in the near term, you know, there's really nothing particularly dangerous that I see on the horizon. What, what um, about the idea which has been put out that, uh, of a tipping point? The idea that as, as CO2 goes up and as temperature goes up, you reach a point where suddenly it runs away with itself, like a kind of spiral so that you know it's a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop, and then there's no recovery from that whatsoever. Is is that on the cards? Well, the climate community redefines tipping points to be much more benign, you know, that are not reversible on a hundred-year time scales. Okay, for inch the, the the one tipping point that is most likely. I don't think it's very likely, but most likely to occur on the time scale of the 21st century is the summertime melting of the Arctic sea ice. In any event, the Arctic sea ice will reform each winter as long as the continents remain in that sort of configuration that they're in. But even then, they, de they define disappearance of Arctic sea ice to mean you know, down there's only 20% left in the summertime. It's not even complete disappearance. Hmm. So, I mean, how is this, you know, a big problem? You know, it reforms every winter. And if the climate were to cool again, it would <clears throat> build up a more stable ice pack. So A, I don't think it's dangerous and B, it's, it's pretty easily reversible. The other things that they're talking about are much less likely. And the IPCC six assessment report, the most recent one, just pretty much downplayed the whole idea, you know, of tipping points. And if there are sort of abrupt changes that happen in the Earth's system, and they've happened before and they'll happen again, I mean, they're just as likely to be caused by natural Earth and climate processes as they are to the slow creep of warming. Right. You, you mentioned the IPCC, and, and they kind of spearhead the, um, the the climate discussion. And one of the one of the um, uh, how can I put it? One of the, the things which it, which is often quoted for people who are um, on board with, with with climate change as such, they, they claim that ninety seven percent of climate scientists agree with. Uh, the IPCC and and the same kind of um, approach that they have and the same kind of understanding is is that something which is true that ninety seven percent of scientists agree with the IPCC and that that's really the um, the, the truth of the matter. Okay, well, what you're say, describing is an example of consensus entrepreneurship taking consensus on a few little things and expanding it off into many, many, many different directions. The original 97% came from a paper where a group of activists actually um, looked at a bunch of abstracts 
um, of published papers and sorted them into ones that either acknowledge, accept, or show that you know warming is human cause versus ones that don't. And they came up with a 97% number in that way. That paper was widely criticized for its methods. I mean, the, the issue, okay, what, what scientists agree on is a fairly limited amount of things. <laughs> yes, it's warming. Yes, we're emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. And yes, CO2 has an infrared emission spectra that acts in a direction to warm the planet. But the issue of how much relative to natural variability, there's substantial disagreement. How much warming we can expect in the 20th century, substantial disagreement. Whether warming is dangerous, that's a values judgment. And whether um, rapidly trying to eliminate fossil fuels is in the best interest you know, of human beings in the 21st century. So there's all sorts of uncertainties, but um, President Obama in the US, he tweeted about this paper, the 97%, and it went viral. And he said, 97% scientists agree that climate change is dangerous. Well, no, it wasn't the climate scientists, it was just the abstracts of papers. Um, and there was nothing in that study that said anything about dangerous. So President Obama was being a consensus entrepreneur in terms of expanding that little nugget you know, into, you know, a wide range of directions. And that original 97% paper um, said nothing about the IPCC, people agreeing with the IPCC. Now, ironically, the IPCC, some of the, mo the scientists who are um, most active and alarmed and whatever about this issue, poo-poo the IPCC. They think the IPCC is way too tame. Okay, oh. so they're not, you know, so so what I would say, climate policy and climate activism have left the IPCC's scientific mooring. Okay, and ironically, people who are in the more skeptical contrarian camp or whatever are more likely to cite the IPCC than are the activist scientists. So we've, you know, come to a position where trying to sort out who's who and what's what and where the IPCC stands and all this is, is very, very confusing. Yeah. One of the chapters in, in your book, I think it's chapter four, um, asks the question about what actually is controlling our response. Is it science, strictly speaking, or is it is it politics? And and how political has something like the IPCC become? Is it strictly scientific or not? Well, well the roots, you have to go back to the 1980s to see how all this start. Um, the politics have been way out, the pol you know, the politics have been way out in front of the science from the very beginning. In the 1980s, the UN Environmental Program very much wanted more of a world government, was anti-capitalism, um, they hated, they, they were environmental, they hated big oil, and they latched onto the climate change issue as a perfect vehicle. And this is when um, the IPCC was founded to, you know, encode all this, you know, that could help advise policy. And the first IPCC report was in 1990, and it was quite an honest document. And it said that, well, we don't see, yeah, it's been warming for the past few decades, but we don't really see anything that's beyond natural variability. And here's a whole list of all the things that we don't know and don't understand. Okay, well, the, the UN wasn't very happy about that. They went ahead anyway, two years later in 1992, forming the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change with their big international treaty that 196 countries signed on to prevent dangerous anthropogenic climate change. So be before there was any evidence of warming that was caused by emitting fossil fuels, we had a big international treaty to prevent dangerous climate change. So, I mean, so the IPCC, there was pressure on the IPCC to support this. So in the second assessment report in 1995, they came up with pretty much 
the same conclusion. Well, there's a lot of natural variability. It's hard to really see a signal. And then in the process, with the summary for policymakers, the scientists are in a room with policymakers, representatives from the countries, you know, for a week. And there was enormous pressure on the scientists from the policymakers. Come on, we need more. <laughs> you know, they they were trying to get support for the Kyoto Protocol and everything. And so in the summary for policymakers, they were convinced to add, there is now a discernible evidence of human caused warming. And then they went back and changed the report to be in line with a discernible evidence of human caused warming. And this caused an uproar in scientific circles. Here you had the, politi the politicians driving the contents of the scientific assessment report. Okay, and that was the critical point of corruption of the IPCC, if you will. You know, when they changed their report based on the input from the policymakers. And since then, it's been, you know, it, it's been a mixed bag. Um, in this last IPCC report, I think the first assessment report on the scientific basis was relatively good. The second one on impacts was really bad. And the third one on mitigation was also bad. Although the fifth assessment report, I thought the working group two on impacts was pretty good. So it's a mixed bag. It depends on who the authors are and how good, how much they're able to stand up to pressure from the policymakers. So it, it's very much politicized um, right from the beginning, right I from the beginning. I'm told that the there's a big difference often between the um, the IPC summary of the report and the actual content of the report. I was talking to Richard Lindzen not so long ago, who who said that very often the summary might not actually reflect what's actually the, the data in the report, which seems. Oh quite yeah, it, yeah, it's cherry picked, you know, to support a narrative. And if you dig deep into the report, there's some pretty good material. But anything that's uncertain or controversial or whatever doesn't make it into, into the report. And they also cherry pick, you know, rather than looking back to 1920 or 1930, you know, they start looking at 1970. Look at all this change since 1970. But if you look back in the 30s and 40s, you know, it's not so simple because things were pretty bad then and whatever. So there's a lot of cherry picking that goes on in those summary for policymakers. Okay, the, 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 your book that you that you've written is is divided into um, three main sections, and the the first one is all about um, you know how climate change comes about, what our response should be, and who's controlling the response. The second part is is more about. Um, where it starts off about climate models and, and what we're certain about and what we're not certain about. And you talk about something called the uncertainty monster. Can you say something about that for us? Okay. Um, yeah, the second part of the book addresses, you know, I don't go through every little scientific controversy, but the big issue for policymakers is how is the 21st century going to play out? Okay, so, so that's what part two addresses. But the uncertainty monster is a sort of an interesting story about this. And it, I was at, this would be 2010, there was a Royal Society workshop on uncertainty in science and people from all fields, um, Mervyn King, Sir Roger Penrose, you know, people from many, many different fields, a few people more from climate, but there was from public health and economics and physics and cosmology. And on. it was just a fascinating um, thing. And, and nobody was talking about consensus. <laughs> you know, they were talking about what we don't know, how to understand it, how to convey it and how to really articulate you know, what we know, what we don't know, and what we can't know and in many different fields. And it was just fascinating. And I thought, oh, okay, th this is really what I need to do in context of climate change and climate modeling. And while I was searching for 
the um, material, you know, following up from this meeting, I came across a paper by um, Dutch social scientist, Jeroen van der Suisse, who had written a paper on the uncertainty monster in environmental change. And he was drawing on uh, monster theory, um, particularly from Martinja Smiths, who had written about monster theory as how we're uncomfortable with technology and, you know, all sorts of conflicts. So, you know, I, once I saw it, I said, oh my gosh, uncertainty monster. I know I found my theme. <laughs> and so I wrote a paper in 2011 called Climate Science and the Uncertainty Monster. And it deals with all the discomfort between, you know, what we know versus what we don't know, facts versus values, um, politics versus science, and on and on it goes. And, and so it, it really changed my thinking about um, how to approach this problem. And, and, and there's came up with ways of dealing with the uncertainty monster. Um, the first is to try to hide it. You know, the monster's too big to hide. And then you try to simplify it. And this is what the IPCC does by, you know, counting, you know, letting people vote or counting the number of papers for and against and things like that, that, you know, simplifying that doesn't help. Um, and, and then you try to, then there's monster detection, people trying to figure this out and find all the little uncomfortable things. And then there's monster assimilation where you try to live with the monster and acknowledge the monster and use uncertainty as useful information in the policy making process. So, so that's what the uncertainty monster is all about. And it, it really changed, once I put that frame around it, it, it just, to me, was, it was a much healthier way to approach the science and the science policy interface rather than trying to get these, you know, speaking consensus to power and, and try to negotiating agreement on something that is very, very uncertain and try to... Uh, use that as a basis for demanding that a certain policy be followed. Um, you know, it just seemed a much healthier way um, for both the science and the policy process to really understand and embrace uncertainty. Uh, you, you perceptively quote Nietzsche in, in your book as uh, along these lines, he who fights with monsters might take care lest he thereby become a monster. I wonder if um, in, in, in fighting with climate change, have has the responses that we've we've started to invoke here turned us into monsters in any way? Do you see that? Is that why you quoted the... Uh, yeah, I, I also quoted Don... Quixote, who is trying to tilt at the windmills and trying oh. to destroy the windmills. And I think, oh, yeah, where is Don Quixote when we need him? Um, yes, absolutely. We've, we're in the process of destroying our energy infrastructure. Um, no. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the monster right now. I, 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 I want to come to that in a in a moment or two, but let me just while we're in this section here, which is your second section, you talk a lot about climate models, and I just wonder. People tend to think of climate models as having a high status that they're because you've got a model, you now know what the you've got a handle on the truth in some way. How do you understand the value of climate models? Where were they helpful and where were they not helpful? Um, they're helpful as tools to play around with, tweak parameters and try to understand the sensitivity of the climate system to various things like um, uh, specify the ocean temperature in a certain way and see how the climate responds, um, dump a bunch of aerosol particles into the atmosphere, see how it changes the clouds and how that changes the climate, that kind of thing. Playing sort of trying to understand the sensitivity of the climate to various processes and try to unravel things. Um, cleverly designed climate model experiments can you know, help us think better 
about how the climate systems work. They are not prediction machines, or they shouldn't be used. I mean, you, you can run it forward and make predictions, but they don't mean very much. Um, they're also not helpful for trying to untangle how much of the recent warming has been natural versus human cause because they don't properly deal with the natural processes. So by definition, they're going to come to a solution that's human cause. Mm -hmm. um, th they can't be used for addressing regional climate change because they don't get the ocean circulation processes right. And those are a primary driver of regional climate change. They can't be used to um, attribute extreme weather events like Hurricane Ian was made 7% worse by global warming, like those kind of statements that come out all the time. Mm -hmm. Climate models can't be used because they don't even simulate the extreme weather events, anything close to correctly. So they're not of much, much use. And, and the study of how they came to be so dominant you know, it's, it's an interesting topic in sociology, but the interesting thing is that the IPCC six assessment report really backed off from the climate models. They realized that they're running too hot. They realized that they're deficient and they were using, I mean, they used the climate models, but they weren't dominant in the IPCC reports in the way that they had been in the previous reports. Right. So, uh... You say that they're not um, predictive in, or they shouldn't be used in a predictive way. And yet, isn't that exactly the way in which they have been used? I mean, I've come across many people who suggest that, you know, come 2050, if we don't do anything at the moment, then this is going to happen. You know, the world will become a desert or something. And there are a number of um, school children I, I heard quite recently who are suffering from depression because they believe the world won't be in existence in 10 or 15 years time when they'll have no future. Uh, Greta Thunberg uh, famously said, you've stolen my future because climate models suggest that there won't be a future if we continue the way we're going. Well, th there's a different type of climate model, the in integrated assessment models. These are simpler models. They're really economic models. These are the ones that tell you what's dangerous and you put in a climate sensitivity and amount of warming or whatever and then it's, it gives you all these socioeconomic consequences you know and they have damage functions and this that and the other and and these are toy models completely toy models the things that are used to derive the social cost of carbon and to give us these emissions targets and deadlines and on and on and go it's these integrated assessment models and these are absolutely toy models and why people people who build those models, they, they disagree with each other. The different models give substantially different results and they disagree with each other. But certain people get politically blessed and get to write certain government reports and whatever. So it's all, uh, you know, it's again the politicians leading the science in a direction that they want it to go. But you know, the, the stuff that's gone on in the last really since 2018, you know, when Greta came on the scene, and then you have Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil, and on and on it goes. There's been this apocalyptic marketing that's targeted at young people. Um, children and young adults that is just unconscionable. I mean, that's leading to depression. And now there's sort of a backlash against this. People realize, well, this is backfiring because people are apathetic. They're, they're not trying to solve the problems. You know, they're just depressed into doing nothing. So there's now a backlash against some of this. And I think even Extinction Rebellion is backing off and trying to find more productive ways to, to work within their objectives. But it's, it's a terrible situation. And um, yeah, it's a terrible situation. Yeah, you, you talk about models in quite some, some detail, I think. And uh, I think there's one section there, you've got a worst case scenario. Well, what is the worst case scenario that we're looking at really here from the models that they, they provide? Okay, well, I don't use the models to talk about worst case scenarios because oh, I yeah. think they don't help. <laughs> um, 
you know, the emission scenario, the worst case emission scenario, this is RCP 8.5. They used to call this business as usual, the very high emission scenario. And, and when people talk about climate change impacts and really bad things happening, they're talking about the RCP 8.5 emission scenario. Well, people now realize that it's totally implausible, if not impossible. And even the UN Framework Commission has dropped um, this extreme scenario from its projections and, and what it's working from. Nevertheless, the IPCC still uses it. Most of the published literature about extreme weather events or whatever still uses. So you're getting this apocalyptic narrative based on this implausible emission scenario that is still dominating not just the public discussion, but it's still dominating the scientific literature and even the IP IPCC assessment reports. So by the time we get to the next cycle of IPCC assessment reports, which is 2030, which of course will all be dead by then if you believe <laughs> um, Greta at all, um, there, there will be no way that they can justify continuing to use that emission scenario. It'd be interesting to see what they come up with because once you drop that extreme emission scenario, it, you just have a slow creep um, of warming and slow creep of warming and a slow creep of sea level rise, you can normalize, you can easily adapt to that. You know, once you separate this incremental risk of slow warming from the extreme weather event risk, I mean, floods, heat waves, hurricanes and all that, they've always happened, they always will happen, whether there's some discernible change for better or for worse associated with the warming, it's too small to really identify, but we still have to deal with those. Um, figure out how to minimize their impacts, adapt and so on. But using these extreme weather events to motivate um, rapid emissions reductions, you know, just flies in the face of common sense. Yeah. Well, let, let's come on to that because um, the, the third part of your book is about risk and about whether we've estimated the risk correctly and whether we're responding to whatever risks there are in the most appropriate way. I wondered if you could add something about that. Have we have we got a proper understanding of the risk due to climate change? And have we analyzed it correctly? Um, no, we haven't. I mean, I for the last four or five years, I've steeped myself into the risk science literature. And I've realized how naive the approach that we've taken to characterizing um, the climate risk um, is how just flat out wrong. I mean, we, we've assumed that it's going to be really bad and we've taken the precautionary principle to try to eliminate fossil fuel emissions and everything will be fine, you know, <laughs> without looking at um, the adverse consequences of eliminating fossil fuels, which will make us um, poor and less able to adapt and respond to whatever kind of climate variability and extreme weather we might encounter over the 21st century. So we're just um, making ourselves more vulnerable right now mm -hmm. by raising energy prices and reducing its reliability. So, Can you say, say something more about the precautionary principle and and um, well, for those people who don't know what it is, they just explain what the precautionary principle is and, and whether it's valid or whether it isn't valid or, or when it is valid or when it, when it isn't. How, how should we know whether we should be taking precautions or whether we shouldn't just in case something might happen? Okay, well, everybody understands caution. Okay, when you're crossing the street, you look both ways. Okay, when, when you, when it's... Um, looks like it might rain, you bring an umbrella, you know, you, 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 th these are well understood things and you take cautionary actions. Precaution differs from caution is precaution implies that there's some scientific uncertainty about what might happen. Um, so so that you're in, when you're in the realm of precaution, certainly with COVID and 
climate change, you're in a realm of precaution because there's so many uncertainties. Now, precaution isn't a bad thing. The, the precautionary principle is something that is really more stringent, that it, it, it's tied to, you know, trying to eliminate the source of the risk. And if it's for something simple, like let's say some papers found that red dye number two causes cancer in whatever, and maybe we should take the precaution of eliminating red dye number two from our food supply, you know, even if, you know, you can debate about whether it's correct or not, but the cost of doing that is pretty minimal. You know, just use, if you need red color, you know, use beets or something. Um, so, so you can easily eliminate that. But when you're talking about eliminating fossil fuels, that, that's a whole different kind of situation because fossil fuels have provided the basis for our prosperity, health, safety, and progress, you know, for the past several hundred years. And so unless you can immediately replace that with something cleaner, you know, we're going to have a tough time ahead um, unless we, we either have to, I mean, I'm all in favor of, you know, a, a better 21st century energy infrastructure than what we have now, you know, cheaper, cleaner, more abundant, whatever, who wouldn't want that? But try, But thinking that wind and solar is it and thinking that we can immediately transition is, is a very big mistake. It's going to make our risks even worse. So it, it, there, it comes down to the urgency. Um, if, if, if we're really talking about the slow incremental risk and it's not a very high magnitude and tipping points aren't really in play, then there's no particular urgency about making this transition. So we've sort of mischaracterized it. Um, so invoking the precautionary, I mean, the COVID analogy was to lock everybody down and think that we could um, control, eliminate and control the risk in this way. Well, we couldn't, um, you know, with any complex risk, that's global in dimensions and a great deal of uncertainty, you can't control it. So, so the precautionary principle implies that we can actually control these things. I mean, we can't control climate change any more than we could control the COVID epidemic. What we can do is seek to better understand the risk and then figure out how to manage it and adapt to it and minimize the consequences rather than trying to actually prevent the risk. So that, that's, you know, when we have like systemic risk, a wicked problem, things that are, you know, huge dimensions with many different interactions and interplays and networking all over the place. I mean, there's no way that you can control this. And even if you think that you can, when you try to poke it in some way and control a part of it, you may un end up with unintended, un desirable consequences that are even worse than the original problem that you were seeking to prevent control, whatever. So, so that's where I see we're sitting with the climate change problem. We're trying to control this. We can't control the climate. Even, even if we could eliminate CO2 emissions, we're not going to be able to actually control the CO2 atmosphere in the, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And we're not going to be able to control the climate. Those things are more complex than simply, you know, turning off the spigot of CO2 emissions from fossil fuels. So it's really about the futility of control when you're talking about these highly complex global problems that we should just abandon the pretense of trying to control. Um, that's not to say we should endlessly keep, you know, dumping stuff into the atmosphere and that we couldn't, that it, there aren't better um, energy technologies that we could use, but this sense of urgency is very much misplaced and it leads us to uh, using inferior technologies that are readily available right now 
that are going to cause more problems in the long run. And there, there's no way that wind and solar could provide the amount of energy that we need in the 21st century, which is going to be orders of magnitude more than what we're currently using. I don't know what it's like in, in the US, but here in the UK, we're looking to become carbon zero by 2050. And to do that, they're banning the sale of all new petrol and diesel cars by 2030, which is only seven years off. And the sale of all domestic gas boilers has got to be stopped as well. And despite all the energy shortages, which we may well have, they're putting a stop to fracking too. This is uh, the kind of response which is being done for, for climate change. What's your comments on, on those kind of things then? Um, it's insane. Um, I, th I think the drive to, you know, some of the, the new electric technologies like heat pumps, they make sense, um, provided you have an inverter and the right technologies for cold climates. I think electric vehicles is potentially some nice technologies, but we need we need batteries that don't it, it's the material use for the batteries, you know, the rare earths and everything that is causing a problem. We need better battery technologies before we we mandate this. And by mandating that we transition to those electric technologies, it's going to increase our the need for electricity by a huge amount. And it's going to Okay, if the electricity goes out right now, it's sort of an inconvenience, you know, for six hours or something like that. But when it means that the, nobody has heat and nobody can charge their cars, nobody can move, you know, then it becomes much more consequential when the electricity goes out. And with the intermittency of wind and solar power and the extreme demands that it makes on the transmission system, which increases the unreliability, it's going to be the electric power system is going to be much more unreliable. And until, until we figure out how to store vast amounts of electricity that can account for week-long periods of stilling of the wind, and in the wintertime when there's little solar, um, you're going to need a shadow power system of coal, natural gas, whatever, to back it up. And so you're, you're running two power systems and this basically doubles the cost of your electricity. I mean, the, the countries and states that are very, fairly far along this process are seeing their electricity costs skyrocket, which damages your economy and reduces your prosperity. And on and on it goes. So this is a big mistake. Um, in the US, you know, the federal government pays lip service and certain states are moving very aggressively to meet those kind of targets and others are completely resisting. There's a lot of coal burning in the Western US. We have good coal resources there and they say, hell no, they're being sued by activists and you know, we'll see how this plays out. But it's reality- not, And it, it's, not, it's not just energy issues too because it's affecting other things also. I don't know if it's happening in, in, in the States, but. There's a, there's a great movement here to stop eating meat and to get rid of all the cows because they claim they're producing methane gas from. Uh, I mean, this eating. is even worse. I mean, and, and also fertilizers too are being. Um, don't, uh, don't mess with the food system. I mean, this yeah. is such a mistake. I mean, this is such a mistake. Um, there are better farming practices that can be used regenerative agriculture and on and on it goes you know that we can um, do a better job with our agriculture but um, getting rid of meat you know getting rid of fertilizer is just a huge mistake it's just a huge mistake and agriculture is like 12 percent of the emissions i mean it's in the noise um yeah. It's really a noise. So messing with the food supply at this point is just unbelievably stupid. But that um, that's, is what's going on. I mean, over I this night, so we've got um, in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a remarkable. Country. It's quite small, but it's the second largest food producer in the world after after the states. And um, and they want to close down. I think a third of the farms there because and 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 stop all the agricultural production because of fertilizers. It's quite. 
did have some quite significant impact, I would think. Yes, I mean, that, that's a terrible situation. So, you know, when is the stupidity going to end? I don't know. Um, well, that brings me really to my final question, um, Judith, and, and that is, I'm going to ask you, if I may, to, to take out of uh, and polish your crystal ball and um, and do something which you probably don't normally do as a scientist, which is predict the future for me. I mean, where will we be in terms of climate change? I mean, where will we be in 50 years' time? And how will we look back at this particular point, do you think? Um, 50 years' time, the climate will probably be a little bit warmer. Um, we'll probably go through a two to three decade long period where the extreme weather events calm down. Um, there's these ocean oscillations, you know, it, it, in the 70s and 80s, it was pretty calm. You know, it's it's been relatively bad the last decade or so, but we go through these cycles, we'll see, we will cycle back to a period when it's calmer in terms of extreme weather events. Um, the, the countries that embrace nuclear technology will do very well economically and environmentally. And we'll see wind and solar ending up as a niche solution. I mean, wind, solar, and natural gas, I mean, at the current margin, they are reducing CO2 emissions, but it's not the long-term solution. I mean, it's geothermal and nuclear power and maybe rooftop solar and wind will be a niche solution. Um, offshore wind in most places is a very bad idea. So I think we're going to see um, at the end of the day, again, the, the countries who embrace nuclear power will end up ahead. And the countries that don't mess with their <laughs> food production will also end up ahead. And so at, at some point, um, the there was a minister in New Zealand who made a, a comment, and I cited this in the book, and it was it, it's something that just stuck in my head. He was being grilled because they were developing some natural gas resources or coal resources or something like that. He said, well, how can you be doing this when, when New Zealand is such a, a leader and has so much rhetoric and whatever about how we need to reduce emissions. And he said, well, climate change is an insufficient crisis compared to you know, energy and food shortages. And I thought that was perfect, an insufficient crisis. Mm -hmm. And people will you know, realize that. And I think they realized it a little bit. I think the Ukraine war was a wake up call, you know, that wait a minute, you know, if, natural gas is nice, but if that's not coming, we're, we're just going to burn coal. And um, people, you know, and, you know, Germany is, is the one country that stands out as just being in an irrational place. You know, they're supposed to be leading on all this and they're upping their coal burning. Um, and, and I think that's more than canceled out all of the renewable energy that they've installed. They shut down all their nuclear power plants. And again, they were getting their gas from Russia, which that spigot has been turned off and now they're burning coal. And they've canceled out all of their gains from all that renewable energy stuff. And the cost of their power is sky high. So at some point, you know, it's politically untenable. I mean, Citizens, people get it. I mean, they want food and energy and they just want generally clean air and they understand that, you know, bad weather happens. But it's the politicians that are just sort of locked into this. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm fairly, op I'm a techno optimist. I think that, um, you know, humans are very ingenious. And as long as we have enough electric power to support our ingenuity, <laughs> you know, we can move forward with lots of new ideas and new technologies. Um, so, you know, I'm fairly optimistic that people will come to their senses. 
I it's good to end, in, I think, on a on a positive, um, on optimistic note there. But uh, Judith Carey, thank you ever so much for an excellent and interesting conversation today. Uh, the book, uh, just to remind you, uh, is called Climate Uncertainty and Risk, Rethinking Our Response by Judith Carey. It's actually published next month on the 6th of June. 2023 on both sides of the Atlantic in the UK and in the US and it's 22 pounds from Amazon UK and I believe 35 dollars from Amazon US and I have read uh, the book and I have to say that it's well worth getting um, it's very well argued and very tightly referenced as well everything is backed up very solidly so Judith thank you very much indeed for your time hey well thank you my pleasure